Hi, I'm John Davies. I'm a meteorologist and I've been a storm chaser for over 30 years. I've put together this short video to address some issues about the high precipitation supercell on tornadoes southwest of Lawrence, Kansas back on May 28th of this year. The storm chaser safety video about May 28th that Skip Talbot released last week is good in highlighting spotting issues with HP storms and I support that. HP supercells are often quite difficult. The top HP storm here is certainly easier to assess visually than the bottom one from May 28th. But Talbot's video has problems. Much of his radar analysis is wrong, and there were two mesocyclones. Talbot minimizes the northern one and its impact on the evolution of the storm. Another serious problem is that Talbot claims his work is done in a cooperative spirit to prevent future incidents like what happened to Silver Lining Tours on May 28th. Yet he negates that by singling out SLT and implying negligence on their part in a difficult and rapidly evolving situation, spoiling much of the educational value. I'm not great at doing videos, but some issues in his presentation do need to be addressed. Let's start with the developing northern mezzo around 6 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Here is Robert Reynolds' view of it as he headed north on County Road 1029 toward Lone Star Lake. It's entirely understandable and appropriate the chasers would be concerned about this feature, both visually and from radar, where it was quite evident. Quincy Vagel had this view. Contrary to what Talbot says, this became the primary mesocyclone and soon produced the Lawrence Linwood EF4 tornado. Rather than racing north to get into the notch, most chasers were simply following this feature, but got caught in a rapidly evolving situation that was not simple to assess or anticipate. This accelerating area of rain back to the southwest, the wet rear flank downdraft gust front, is the main focus of Talbot's video. Unknown to chasers, a mesocyclone and unreported tornado were deeply occluded and invisible back in the surging rain-filled area. The only way to know that the tornado was there would be scrupulous attention to level 2 radar data. And remember, there were two danger areas to keep track of, including the area to the north. Compared to the HP supercell at top here, this stage of the Lawrence supercell would have taken a moment to assess and understand, particularly with this dark cloud basin developing mesocyclone to the north. Now let's talk about radar data. Rather than the kidney bean shape so often mentioned with HP supercells, the Lawrence storm looked more like the image on the right. When assessing radar for the Lawrence supercell, remember the typical supercell mesocyclone evolution from Don Burgess's classic model in 1982. In that model, a mesocyclone develops and moves northeast, sometimes producing a tornado. Now, if the mesocyclone goes on for a while, often rain wraps around the core of the mesocyclone, cooling the air and causing it to occlude. When that happens, often a new mesocyclone will form to the east or to the north, the occluded one drifts further back in the rain and usually dissipates, while the new one intensifies off to the east or to the north, like it did on May 28th. Knowing this typical evolution, the northern mesocyclone is part of a cycle, where one mesocyclone occludes and weakens, while another develops and intensifies to its east or north. Let's track this evolution on radar. The original tornadic mesocyclone crossing Highway 56 east of Overbrook is seen in the lowest elevation velocities here with a long corridor of inflow to its north. I like this color scheme because it really highlights the strongest storm relative velocities. Six minutes later, the strongest velocities are farther north, signaling the development of a large new mesocyclone west of Lone Star Lake. There is no longer a corridor of strong velocities flowing into the smaller mesocyclone and tornado, now well south of the newer mesocyclone. Another six or seven minutes forward, and the new mesocyclone is really ramping up, with a stream of strong velocities in blue feeding directly into it. Meanwhile, the smaller occluded mesocyclone and tornado is speeding up and moving toward the new mesocyclone as it intensifies rapidly. A few minutes later, the merger of mesocyclones is complete, with one large mesocyclone and tornado after a period of rapid storm evolution. Here's the same evolution with mesocyclone locations plotted over radar reflectivity images. Notice the new northern mesocyclone with a comma head of heavier precipitation and dark red organizing around it. The two mesocyclones move closer together with the southern one accelerating toward the intensifying northern one. After the merger, the new large mesocyclone is now located in the center of the precipitation comma head. 
Plotting the mesocycline locations in sequence, it is easy to see the newer one pulling the old one into its circulation. Here is my ground survey of the mesocyclone and tornado merger near Lone Star Lake on May 28th. Notice the similarity to my survey of the Heston Gossel, Kansas merger of long track tornadoes in 1990. I sent that information to Dr. Fujita at the University of Chicago, who came up with this graphic, which appeared in my 1994 paper in Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. With fellow storm chaser Roy Britt, we located photos of the merger looking southwest. The tornado at left was the occluding long track Heston F4 tornado, while a new mesocyclone and tornado was forming to its north at the right. The old Heston tornado was pulled around to the north side of the intensifying mesocyclone and tornado, where it merged into the new circulation. With this merger, the large Gossel F5 tornado developed. How might this look if the Heston supercell was HP in nature? The gust front and RFD south of the newly developing mesocyclone would be filled in with rain, obscuring the occluded tornado, as on May 28th. But notice, too, the long dark cloud base associated with the new mesocyclone. When you factor in lower cloud bases and poorer visibility with the May 28th Lawrence supercell, is there some similarity? Although Talbot does not acknowledge it, there was indeed a danger area confirmed by radar velocities with this newly developing northern mesocyclone. So let's discuss some terminology issues. Doswell came up with the term bear's cage back in the 1970s. He has stated that it refers to the rotation area in a mesocyclone. If so, then how do we refer to this area of the storm farther south? To be consistent with the definition, the true bear's cage or mesocyclone here is well back in the rain. But Talbot arbitrarily expands the term's meaning to refer to the entire rain area, which can be confusing and ambiguous. For clarity and consistency, maybe a different term is needed to refer to this area to properly convey its danger and avoid confusion. Now to review, these slides are a schematic overview of the evolution of the mesocyclones and tornadoes on May 28th southwest of Lawrence. The original tornadic mesocyclone entered Douglas County southeast of Overbrook and was wrapped in rain from its beginning. This tornado rapidly occluded in a rain-filled RFD surging northeastward, possibly in response to a newly developing mesocyclone to the north. This accelerating occluded tornado, unreported and now deep in rain, impacted SLT southwest of Lone Star Lake and nearly struck storm chaser Robert Reynolds on the south side of the lake. Meanwhile, the rapidly intensifying northern mesocyclone began to produce its own tornado. Both mesocyclones and tornadoes then merged together northeast of Lone Star Lake, followed by a large and violent tornado. I do need to point out that it is not appropriate to compare chaser strategizing and positioning at these two different points 15 minutes apart, as Talbot does. Southwest of Lone Star Lake, where many county roads were not paved and complicated by trees and hills, the supercell was going through a rapid evolution that involved two mesocyclones and made structure assessment and positioning difficult. Farther northeast, closer to Lawrence, the storm had completed significant reorganization and was more established in visual structure. A large tornado had also been confirmed with enhanced wording in the warning text. As the supercell moved south of Lawrence, there were also no visual or radar-indicated mesocyclones to its north to complicate chaser viewing and positioning. The road network near Lawrence was much better with many options for relocating and making quick decisions. Talbot makes none of these distinctions in his video. I also have to say that this is one of the most deeply occluded tornadoes back into the rain that I have encountered in my research experience with high precipitation supercells. It is one to one and a half miles back into the rain from the leading edge of the rain-filled RFD gust front. Before I close, I must also point out that Talbot comparing the Lawrence storm to the Joplin supercell back in 2011 is wrong and way off base. Visibility that day was horrible due to haze and low cloud bases as merging cells and clusters developed rapidly west of Joplin. None of Talbot's visual clues would have worked. What saved my wife and me was seeing radar rotation develop on the southwest side of Joplin and moving as fast as we could through Joplin across the eventual tornado path, away from storms clustering to our north. 
The poor visibility and very rapid evolution of clusters into a deadly tornadic storm that day contributed to more than 150 deaths. Wrapping up, what confuses people when trying to learn about spotting and assessing HP storm structure is how different HP storms look when compared to classic supercells, which are usually the focus of spotter training. But with thorough and revised training and repetition, spotters and storm chasers can learn to anticipate and avoid rain-filled RFD surges where, on occasion, tornadoes may be deeply occluded way back in the rain. Remember that reviewing data months after an event is much different than having to make fast decisions within a minute or two when you're not immediately clear about what is evolving. Instead of finger pointing and blaming when miscalculations occur during a rapidly developing situation, let's focus on how we can make storm spotter and chaser training better for more people. Seriously, let's get away from accusations and focus on the greater good. Thanks for watching.